So it's come to my attention that um, I, I, the slide deck I provided was the wrong one. So I'm going to do the sand slides. Um, it, there were a couple of uh, pictures I wanted to show you, but I'll try to describe them as best, as, best that I can. So what I want to do today is tell you my story. And uh, I started as an open education advocate as a college student and now uh, work at an organization called Spark, uh, leading really important work happening in the United States on open education. So my journey started uh, when I was in college. In the United States, uh, college education has become really expensive. It's part of what you need in US society to be able to get a good job and you know, buy a house, start a family. Uh, and yet, students have to take on huge amounts of debt in order to afford an education. Uh, today, the average student graduates with $40,000 in debt. And when I was in college uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, the US Congress was considering some reforms to the way that uh, the student loan programs work, and they were going to cut a bunch of money that was going to help students afford education, and I thought that was wrong. So I worked with fellow students around the state that I was in, Washington State, and we worked to influence a key swing vote in, in Congress to try to stop this. His name was Dave Reichert. And we did all sorts of things. We went around uh, and organized uh, letters to the newspaper. We had student governments pass resolutions. And it came down to the day before the vote. We were out in the rain, because it's Washington State and it rains all the time. And we had signs outside of the congressperson's office uh, rallying to try to get him to change his vote. And I was going to show you a picture of that. Um, and. Halfway through the rally, uh, somebody came down from the congressman's office and asked for the organizer. And it wasn't until that point that I realized that was me. Um, and uh, I was like, oh, what's happening? Uh, but they took me up to the congressman's office and put me on the phone with him from Washington, DC. He stepped off the floor of the US Congress to talk to me, a student, about an issue that I cared about, the cost of higher education. And he listened to me for half an hour. The next day, he voted for the bill, which is the outcome we didn't want, so we lost. Um, so I learned some important things, though. Uh, there is success and failure. Uh, after that vote, the congressman actually called us and asked what he could do to help make higher education more affordable, and actually voted with us on several reform bills after the Congress changed hands uh, in the next election. So we built a relationship that ultimately did end up helping students, even, if, even though we lost the first time around. So that brings us to about 2006. When I was graduating, uh, I went to work with a student organization. And uh, we ended up organizing campaigns uh, to engage students on higher education affordability. And then uh, the Cape Town Declaration was released in 2008 and talked about a revolution, a global revolution in teaching and learning that would make sure that knowledge is freely accessible uh, to all students and all citizens across the world. And ended up working with college students across the country to organize uh, professors to sign on to a statement supporting the idea of open textbooks as a way to make college more affordable. So I had already tried my hand at trying to change national policy around higher education affordability and made some progress. But I realized that the cost of course materials was actually a huge problem for students and ended up getting 1,000 professors across the country to sign a statement in support of open textbooks. And we were able to leverage that into national media coverage for the idea of open educational resources in 2008. Uh, so 10 years ago, <laughs> um, and got a really big article in the largest newspaper in the United States that helped launch uh, a national conversation around this idea. And over the intervening years, uh, worked with uh, students to do a number of, of different campaigns to raise awareness. Um, my favorite one was uh, in 2011, we got two giant mascot costumes, like the ones you see at football games. Um, 
and uh, put them in a van and drove them across the country to different campuses. We stopped at 40 different universities uh, with these, uh, uh, one of the costumes was a good guy textbook and one of the costumes was a bad guy textbook. So the really expensive textbook and then the open textbook. And we were able to organize rallies with students uh, looking at the, the textbooks and signing petitions in support of open educational resources. And we're able to get over 100 news articles uh, in papers across the country. And that helped lead to uh, where we are today um, in my work with Spark, which engages academic librarians to help support the transition to open educational resources. Uh, librarians are actually a really important link between students and faculty and can help find and curate resources. So in 2015, we launched the first uh, network of academic librarians for open education in the US. It's now over 1,000 people. And uh, librarians are working with students on their campuses to help expand the use of, of open textbooks. And uh, this network also provides a really important foundation for advocacy efforts. And in the United States, we've been able to make a lot of progress over the last five years in advancing open education at both the federal and the state level. So there are over 20 US states that have adopted some kind of OER policy or launched a major initiative that either funds the creation of open educational resources, uh, provides uh, information to students on which courses use open resources, or create task forces or studies in their states to support the use of open materials. We've also made a lot of progress on the federal level. So in 2015, Spark worked with a number of organizations uh, in our community to organize a letter to President, uh, then President Obama. Uh, over 100 organizations signed it, calling for an executive order that would make all publicly funded educational resources open. We didn't get it. Um, again, but we did get a couple of really important policy changes at two of the federal agencies, the Department of Labor and the Department of Education, that do make sure that all federally funded resources that come from grants in those agencies are openly licensed. And most recently, we've made progress in the US Congress securing federal funding to support open resources as a college affordability measure going back to the kind of beginning of, of the work that I was doing. Um, and just this year, Congress provided the first ever fund to support work at colleges and universities to expand the use of open educational resources that generate savings for students, which is the, the driving factor in our country. And um, we were able to secure that funding not only once, but twice. We got to renew it a second time around. And what that says is from our Congress, even though $5 million isn't a huge amount of money, especially in the context of our government, it is an endorsement that Open is part of our national strategy for making higher education affordable, and that it's a strategy that our lawmakers not only believe in, but are willing to put taxpayer dollars behind. So thinking back to kind of my, my story and my career, um, a few lessons learned. So one is that small steps add up. So the $5 million uh, we got two years in a row from Congress, the senator who championed that is someone that I actually started working with when I was um, uh, very t 22 years old. Um, I had my first meeting with his office. And over the years, built a relationship with the work that he does um, and was able to um, leverage that into a victory. So even if you lose some, if you keep working hard, um, it eventually does add up to success. Uh, student voices are also really powerful. The reason we do work in education, all of us, is for students. And it's important that their voices are not only, um, that we're not only working for them, but we're working with them. And their voices are included in the work we do. And then finally, you are the person that you have been waiting for. Um, one of the, the things I see that's common among open advocates is that there's um, hesitance to maybe step up or lead or push for open in your community because you think there might be somebody who's better qualified to do that or um, that you feel like you're not like the right person to do it. 
And um, I started doing this when I was 19. I had, when I walked up to that congressperson's office, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and yet, I still had an impact. And I encourage all of you to think about the ways in your life and, and in, in your work that um, you can advance openness and step up. Um, and even those small steps can, can be big ones. Thank you. Bravo.